Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. Today we are in Lech Lecha. We're in the uh, book of Bereshit, the book of beginnings. We're looking in uh, chapter 12 to uh, 17, and we're talking about Avraham, right? We're this time called Avram, right? But we're looking at the life of this one man and his family. And what we understand, Avram is claimed by three of the major world religions. I mean, he's, he's an integral part of who we are. And why is that? Well, there's a lot to be said about this person, right? Uh, Avram, he was a great man of faith. And faith is not just saying, I believe something. Faith is an action attached to it, you know, just like James says. The book of James is awesome because it really puts ourselves in front of a mirror and, and says, uh, look at yourself before you take a look at others and make sure that what you're doing in your heart is, is right and calls us to repentance and fix some things in our own life and issues, right? Uh, I recommend going back and reading the book of James if you haven't done that in a while. But here we see that Avram, he, he's being called for for himself literally how it reads lech lecha is to literally read go to yourself uh translates as go for yourself but the the lamed is to or toward so go toward yourself it doesn't really make sense that way but what we find is that yahweh says as he goes yahweh is going to bless him and he's going to use his life to impact literally the world, all the nations of the world, and all those that follow follow after him, right? And that could be uh, physically, but also spiritually, because like we said, Avraham, he was a great man of faith. He believed, therefore, he did. Yahweh called him out, and Avraham was obedient because he believed Yahweh. He, he said, this is the one true God, I'm going to follow him. And as he did, see, that's called belief. Just to say, I believe something, you could say you believe anything, but it's when you act on what you believe is when your belief is made known, is when others can see your belief as well, and plus it solidifies it within you. You can say you believe something, but if you're put to the test of it, do you really believe it, then uh, it's, it's made known to, to yourself if you believe this or not. So that's another thing I find interesting when he always says, lech lecha, go to yourself, that he says, I'm, I'm doing this for you, but I'm doing this beyond you. Okay, Avraham stepped out in blind faith, literally. He always says, I'm gonna take you to a place and um, I'll let you know when you get there, kind of, right? So there's a lot to be said about this. There is a purpose to Yahweh calling Avraham out. And that purpose is to bless the nations, to ultimately have an impact in the earth that is far reaching than just the little area of the earth that he lived on. There was a purpose here, and the purpose was so that others and all the other nations could follow an example that he set. I believe Yahweh, therefore I follow him. I believe him, therefore I will do what he is asking of me. So there's a lot to be said about this man and uh, some things we're going to cover in here today. And the next couple of weeks, we'll see where it goes. But here we're talking in, in Genesis 12, and uh, let's go back and look at it. So Adonai says to Avram, get going out from your land. It's kind of like, it's funny, I read that. It's like, go on now, get, right? <laughs> get going out of your land and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. My heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you, to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. My desire is to bless those who bless you, but whoever curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Interesting, because he says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That word, uh, in, to be blessed, v'nivrachu, is uh, the, root, the root of this also is associated with mavrik, which means to graft. So it's interesting, again, how we say Avram is a father of our faith, but yet what does he really have to do with us walking in faith? He is this great example for us to follow, of course, and sure, but yet we find that through his example and how he's showing us to follow Yahweh, we're coming into a place of covenant with Yahweh. You know, we're following the one true God, okay? So moving a little forward and, and him being called out, right? Let's look at it. Genesis 17, verses 4 and 5. For my part, because my covenant is with you, you will be the father of a multitude of nations. See that? Not just a nation, a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be Avram, but your name will be Avram because I make you the father of a multitude of nations. And in Genesis 18, verses 18 and 19, it says, uh, seeing that Abraham will most certainly become a great and mighty nation, 
and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have made myself known to him, so that he will command his sons and his household after him to keep the way of Adonai by doing righteousness and justice, so that Adonai may bring upon Avram what he has spoken about him. So again, it's, uh, it's Avraham will, because of this man, Avraham, he will be a blessing to nations, right? Isaiah 42, 5 to 7 says, Thus says God, Adonai, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and ruach to those who walk in it. I, Adonai, called you in righteousness. I take hold of your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, by opening blind eyes and bringing prisoners out of the dungeon and those sitting in the darkness out of the prison house. So we find that Avraham was being called out, but this purpose goes beyond Avraham and his family. It's not just something he's saying, hey, this is just something I'm doing for you and your wife. No, he said, this, I'm doing this so that there is an example here for nations that will come from you and all of these nations will look back to a place of covenant and that's what the father wants us to live in have that example of a place of covenant that we have faith in yahweh and yahweh alone and we will walk according to his ways why because that is our heart to do so we have entered into a place of covenant for him okay so Abraham was being called out and this was there's a greater purpose to this when he's called out he was to be an example of faith he was to be a light to those around him he was to be a foundation for the nations that would come from him but something else interesting we see here is we're starting to see a transition of relationship with Yahweh Yahweh is building his nation. He's building a set apart people. This requires a few individuals to be called out, but the emphasis is on the, the greater nation, right? I mean, we see as we're reading the book of beginnings, we're seeing how Yahweh uses individuals and all through the scripture, all through the Tanakh, he, he calls individuals and gives purpose to individuals. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we do have a personal relationship with Yahweh, but at the same time, we start to see a shift here. Instead of Yahweh just, just calling out one person, he starts to make this transition into having a covenant people, a people called by his name, not just some individuals here and there. No, he's calling a nation of people to be set apart and to walk with him. Okay. Ultimately, we, we desire the whole world be filled with people of covenant with Yahweh, but he we're not there yet okay we're not there right now so yahweh is saying he has a nation of people that are set apart from the other nations and Abraham is a big part to play in this okay in genesis 12 7 we read adonai appeared to Abraham, and he said i will give this land to your seed and so there he built an altar to adonai who appeared to him interesting again because he says uh, he will give this land to his seed he will give this land to his descendants and there what was Avram's response? He built an altar. Looking at uh, Genesis 13, 14 to 16, after Lot separated himself from him, Adonai said to Avram, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are to the north, south, east, and west. For all the land you are looking at, I will give to you and your seed forever. And I will make your seed like the dust of the earth, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your seed could also be counted. See that? So again, for Avram, it's not just about him and his family, it's about him and all those that would descend from him, but we also know as well, it's not just about that either. It's about Avram, all that would come from him, and all those that would come into a place of covenant beside him, with him, okay? How can we come in covenant with Avram? Because we're in covenant with the one true God. We're in covenant with Yahweh, so we have covenant with Avram. Because when you're in covenant with Yahweh, you're in covenant with all those who are in covenant with him, all right? Genesis 15, 18. We'll keep going. On that day, Adonai cut a covenant with Avram, saying, I give this land to your seed from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River. Again, it's talking about you and your descendants, you and those that would come from you. Said the same thing to Itzhak. He reiterated what Yahweh told Avraham. He reiterated to Itzhak. We see this in Genesis 26, 23, and 24. It says, he went up from there to Beersheba, and Adonai appeared to him that night, and he said, I am the God of your father, Avram. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you and multiply your seed for the sake of Avram, my servant. See that? 
not just because it's like, not just because of who you are, not just because I have covenant with you, but because I made a promise to Avram. So we see again, Yahweh is the one who keeps covenant. He keeps promises. And he told Isaac, I'm going to do these things for you and your seed because that's what I told Avram I would do. So he says Avraham and his seed. So that's Yitzhak and as well as those that would come from Yitzhak. It doesn't stop at one generation. It's perpetual. Okay. And since Yahweh is eternal, he can do that. Okay. Uh, and then same to Yaakov. Yaakov in Genesis 35, 11, and 12, God said, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. A nation, interesting phrase here, a nation and an assembly of nations will come from you. From your loins will come forth kings. And the land I give to Abraham and to Yitzhak, I give to you and to your seed. After you will I give the land. We'll touch back on that in a minute. And in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, it says, For you are all sons of God through trusting in Messiah Yeshua. For all of you were immersed in the Messiah, have clothed yourselves with the Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, and you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Avraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. How can you belong to the Messiah be Avraham's seed? Why wouldn't we say you're from the Messiah, right? Because Yahweh made covenant with Avraham. He says, through you, all nations of the earth will be, will be blessed. You can have the idea of being grafted in. Now we're looking at things like Romans 11, Ephesians 2, all these other things in there as well, right? So we're talking about that. And we're also when Yahweh made covenant with Avram and they, he split the animals and they walked between the pieces and made their declarations, Yahweh caused a deep sleep to come on Avram. He did not walk between the pieces and make these declarations. Yahweh did. And if you read the scripture, it says a smoking furnace and a, and a flaming torch. Personally, I believe this is representation of Yahweh and Yeshua walking between these pieces and saying that he is going to keep this covenant with Avraham from generation to generation to generation. Because Avraham and his strength and his power, he cannot uphold a covenant when he's gone. After he has passed on the next generation, they can say, okay, this covenant is to you, but can they truly uphold and power that covenant for all nations as this one person? No. But if Yeshua walked between those pieces, then he can. See that? If Yahweh and Yeshua walk between these pieces, he can uphold that covenant with Avraham because Yeshua is saying, I'm going to do this covenant on your behalf. I'm going to do this covenant in your stead. And then I will bring all, all people from all nations into this place of covenant to the one true God. Be, how? Be in faith, following the example of by faith. See that? There's a lot more to that, but we got to keep moving. Okay. So we're talking about a people becoming a nation, one man becoming a nation. And then we also see a company of nations becoming a nation. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on this. Here we go. So let's look at this for an example. When a nation is formed, it, it's normally, uh, we have a, a grouping of people who they live on land, just somewhat in proximity of one another. They have common goals, common interests, common desires, and so they want to form common groups, all right? For, they form, you know, towns, cities, uh, states, a country, you know? I mean, we have nations formed because people have common goals, common ideas. They're in the same proximity, same place. They have the same, you know, land they share. All is coming in together. Well, that's not the way Yahweh did it. The way Yahweh did it is he made Israel a nation and a land that is not theirs. The nation was built on common identity, not what they had in common, who they had in common. The nation is built on a common identity, not just the patriarchs, but a covenant position with Yahweh and promises that Yahweh made to Avraham. Okay. And it's only after a place of covenant that they, then they were brought into the land because they were made a nation in a land that was not theirs. They became a people in a land that was not theirs. And Yahweh brought them out made declarations with them at Sinai, they, they affirmed this covenant with Yahweh, and then he, then he brought them into the land. They were not a nation, a nation dependent on the land they shared. They were a nation dependent on the covenant position with Yahweh their God. Okay? So, they're a nation not because of what they own. They are a nation because who Yahweh has called them to be. All right? In Genesis 15, 13, again, we see to Avram, know for certain your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. 
And then Yahweh brought them out. We see in, in Exodus 6, verses 5 and 8, it says, I have heard the groaning of Bnei Israel, the sons of Israel, whom the Egyptians are keeping in bondage. So I have remembered my covenant. Covenant with whom? Covenant with Avraham. He says, verse 8, So I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Avraham, the Yitzhak, and the Yaakov, and I give it to you as an inheritance. I am Adonai. So again, he remembered his covenant he made with, with, with Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and because of this, he is now bringing this nation out to himself and bringing them into the land. In Exodus 33, 1, we read, Adonai said to Moshe, leave, get out of this place, you and the people that you have brought out of the land of Egypt, into the land that I swore to Avraham, the Yitzhak, and Yaakov, saying, I will give it to your seed. Again, he's telling him to leave, get out of this land, and go into the land that I will show you. Sound familiar? <laughs> right leviticus 26 40 to 42 says if they confess their iniquity and that of their fathers and the treachery they committed against me and how they walked contrary to me in return i walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies and if at that time their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they accept the punishment of their iniquity then i will remember remember what my covenant with yaakov my covenant with yitzhak my covenant with avraham and i will remember the land so again, we have a place of repentance that's coming to Yahweh. We have a place of repentance and him saying, I remember my covenant. When you repent, I remember my covenant with who? Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. But the interesting thing is he kind of does it backwards, right? He says, Yaakov, Yitzhak, Abraham, and the land. The idea is when we repent and when we come to Yahweh, it brings us to a place of restoration, back to the way it was in the beginning, back to the way everything was created, pointing back to the garden, pointing back to the initial time when Yahweh created everything in perfect order. Okay? It is as he created it to be. All right? So again, when we repent, he brings us back, and he uses the phrasing of covenant with Avraham and his descendants and his seed to bring us back to its place of restoration, this idea of restoration. Deuteronomy 29, 11, and 12, says, each of you is to cross over into the covenant of Adonai your God that he is cutting with you today and into his oath. This is in order to confirm you today as his people. So he will be your God just as he promised you and just as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So again, we have a picture of a people coming to Yahweh and this place of covenant that Yahweh said he made with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Right When they were in Mitzrayim and he brought them out, he says, again, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Avraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov. Again, this is important in a place of covenant for us Okay, to understand how, how, how this worked. Right? So we have a person, we see transition to becoming a nation. We have Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Yaakov, his name was changed to Israel, right? And then all those joined with him in the process. It's not just uh, the natural descendants of this, because even Avraham had those who he, he did not birth in his household, but they became disciples of him. They, they wanted to serve Yahweh. When he circumcised and, and was part of this covenant that Yahweh made, he had others in his household that did the same, that walked with him. Okay, so same thing here. We have Israel, the descendants of Israel, and all those who would come and be joined with them. All the other people from all the other nations, uh, the foreigners, all these people who want to serve the one true God. How do they do that? Again, by faith. You know, the idea of we've been saved by grace through faith, it's always been that way. It's never been any different. Okay, so Avraham was redeemed, right? So again, uh, to Yaakov, he said the Abraham, the Yitzhak, and the Yaakov, we said this. I said, we come back to this, Genesis 35, 11, and 12. God says, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and an assembly of nations will come from you. And then he says, the land I give to Abraham, the Yitzhak, Yaakov, I give it to you in your seat. So again, a nation and an assembly of nations reads, Goy or Kahal Goyim. Kahal is an assembly of or a congregation, a company, a multitude. So what we have is Goy, a nation, and an assembly of nations will come from you. And we see this as, as uh, nations all coming out into the world, but the idea is that they all come back and return in this place of covenant with Yahweh. Though they were in the nations, they become an assemblage of nations. They all come together as one nation. That nation is going to be called Israel. Okay? Israel is, is a people set apart 
to be called by the name of the Most High. Samson Raphael Hirsch puts it this way. The nation which is to descend from him is to represent one entity to the outside world, but internally is to be a multiplicity of elements united into one. Each tribe is to represent an ethnic individuality in its own right. The whole of mankind, with all its diversity, is called on to accept the one common conception of God as taught by Israel, and so form all the different individual and national characteristics of mankind into one united kingdom of God. So we have, we have the, the idea, people from all nations, all walks of life, all over the world, coming in together to be one people in the kingdom of Yahweh. This is a people called Israel. Ephesians 2 says to remember that you were Gentiles. You were Gentiles. You were separated from the Messiah. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But in Messiah Yeshua, you who were far off are brought near. Brought near to what? Well, read it in its context. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of promise that he declared to Israel. But now in the Messiah, Yeshua, you who were far are now brought near. In other words, you've been brought into, grafted in with, brought alongside a covenant people. Ezekiel 47, 22 and 23 says, You are to divide the land by a lot as our inheritance for you, for the outsiders who dwell among you. Whoever bears children among you, they will be to you like the native born of B'nai Israel. They will be allotted an inheritance along with you among the tribes of Israel. And whatever tribe the outsider lives, there you will give him his inheritance. It is a declaration of Adonai. Again, we see a picture of someone who was not born Israel, but wants to be among, with, and alongside Israel because they want to serve the one true God and be a part of his called out covenant people. Now, another thing we see here. One of the many lessons we can see in regards to Avram is to have faith in Yahweh, of course, but and calling on his name. And what it means to call on his name, uh, it's looking toward him, realizing he is our help. He is the one who gives us everything that we have. He is the one that we call on when we give thanks. He is the one he, we call on when we are in distress. He is the one we call on for whatever the need may be. It is him that we call upon. In other words, we call upon him because we trust him. It means that we have faith in him. And what we find here is many times in the scripture to call upon him is relationship to uh, covenant or altars and in, in calling on him, right? We'll get back in Genesis 12. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. Adonai appeared to Avram and says, I will give this land to your seed. So there he built an altar to Adonai who had appeared to him. From there he moved the mountain to the east of Bethel and erected his tent with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built an altar to Adonai and called on the name of Adonai. Again, this is interesting. It's Vayavin Sham Mizbeach Le Yahweh Vayikra Bashem Yahweh. So, and he built, Ben is from the word Benai, and he built there a Mizbeach, an altar to Yahweh and called on the name of Yahweh. It's just like he builds an altar and then just cries out the name. Not really. There was a purpose for him building the altar, and when he cries out to the name of Yahweh, it's a prayer. He's praying to him, and in and, and the situation that he's in and what he's going through, he's, he's praying to Yahweh, and he's saying, you are my God, and, and I, need, I need you in, in my life, and, and whatever pours out in that situation, right? So then what happens? So Avram goes to Mitzrayim, he goes down, and when he returns, what does he do? Genesis 13, 1 through 4 says, so Avram went up from Egypt, and uh, he and his wife, and everything that belonged to him, and Lot with him to the Negev. Now Avram was very rich in livestock, silver and gold, and he proceeded uh, by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar that he made there at first, and there Avram called on the name of Adonai. This, this, you could say, oh, well, he's just saying this is where he did it again. But the way it reads implies he did do it again, not just, oh, he did it before and he's at the same place. It implies he came back and did it again. And then we see as well at Beersheba, Beersheba is the well of the oath. Uh, Avram in Genesis 21, 27 to 33, 
Abraham took a flock of sheep and cattle and gave it to Avimelech. Remember, Avimelech, you know, Abraham, he's building wells and, and the people there don't like it. And we see again, like uh, Yitzhak, he redug his father's wells kind of thing a little later on. And uh, so the people are contentious with Abraham. So what's happening is Abraham and Avimelech, they're entering into this covenant of saying, I dug this well, this is mine, and your people need to back off, okay? And Avimelech is acknowledging, yeah, you dug this well, all right? So they're entering into a place of covenant here with relationship of, of, of testifying of something. So Abraham took the flock of sheep and the cattle and gave it to Avimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs apart from the flock of sheep by themselves, and Avimelech said to Abraham, what do these seven ewe lambs that you set by themselves mean? And he said, you are to accept the seven ewe lambs from my hand, so that they may be a witness for me that I dug this well. And this is why the place is named Beersheba. Be'er, uh, well, Sheva is an oath, but Sheva is also seven. Okay, so again, it's, it's something about that number seven and a completion, right? A perfection. Because there they made a pledge, uh, and they made a covenant in Beersheba. And Abimelech got up with Michael, his commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. And then he planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and what did he do? And he called there on the name of Adonai, the everlasting God. Again, Vayikra Sham Bashim Le Yahweh El Olam. He is Yahweh El Olam. He is Yod He Vav the God that is everlasting. See that? And so there he called upon him. And now he didn't say he built an altar there, but they had proclaimed uh, a covenant there. And so there, Yahweh, he, he again calling out on Yahweh because there was a covenant that was involved. Again, Focus and direction back to Yahweh and all things. All right. So, as they called out people, you have a responsibility. You have a purpose. And your purpose is to reflect the one who called you out, to reflect the one that put you in this place of covenant. So, Israel it was to call upon Yahweh and help establish a people in a place where all could do the same. Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 and 11 says, you are to seek only the place Adonai your God chooses from all your tribes to put his name to dwell. There you will come. Then the place Adonai your God chooses to make his name dwell, there you are to bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the offering of your hand, and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to Adonai. Uh, so again, this is a people set apart, a people to, to call on his name. But then Yahweh says, when you go into the land, I want you to establish a place where all nations can come together and worship the one true God. All people can come together and worship Yahweh. Okay? So, again, it's the idea of, yes, this is a place for Israel, but this is to be a place for all nations to come. Now, this is not a place where all nations to come and call on their own God. No. This is a place for people who want to come from wherever they came from. They want to come in and serve the one true God, Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Okay? So again, uh, we see another picture of this in Solomon when he dedicated the Beit HaMakdash. When, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he prayed. And you can see it in 1 Kings 8, but I'm going to read verses 41 to 43, where it says, Moreover, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, when he comes from a distant country because of your name, for they will hear of your great name, of your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes to pray toward this house, then may you hear from heaven your dwelling place. And do according to all that the foreigner asked of you, so all the people of the earth may know your name, to fear you as your people Israel do, and know that this house that I have built is called by your name. See that? What this is saying is no matter where you came from, they're calling on the one true God, and that, that they will stand as a testimony wherever they go back to, he is Elohim, there is none else. In Isaiah 56, 6 through 8, we read also the foreigners who joined themselves to Adonai, to minister to him, to love the name of Adonai, and to be his servants, all who keep from profaning Shabbat and hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain, and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Adonai Elohim, who gathers the dispersed of Israel, declares, I will gather still others to him who are already gathered. Again, we see a place where all can call on Yahweh and call together a house of prayer for all nations, which Yeshua referenced in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. Remember the story? 
He goes in the temple and drives out those that are selling in the temple, the money changers and those that are doing this. Well, here's the thing, guys. The issue is not they were not that they were there. The issue is they were price gouging the people. I mean, if you wanted to serve Yahweh, you had to bring an un, uh, you had to bring a clean animal to go to the altar. You could not put an unclean animal on the altar. Well, if you were on a long journey and too long to bring the animal, Torah says, sell the animal. And then when you get there, buy what you need. So the people knew people are coming from long distances and they're going to have to buy what they need. So we're going to inflate the price so that I make a better profit. That's wrong. Because the Torah also says you're not to, you're not to put usury on your brother. You're not to charge him unfair amounts, right? So again, uh, this, we see Yeshua referencing this. And, and why would he say, you know, you've referenced this, you know, all people, a house, a house of prayer. Well, let's read it. Matthew 12, 21, 12 and 13. Shua entered the temple and drove out all those selling and buying in the temple. He overturned the tables, the money changers, the seats of those selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. We were making it a den of thieves. And the reference of that, a house of prayer is said, house of prayer for all people. Implying there's people coming from long distances and long ways that are going to have to purchase what they need to worship once they get there. So, yeah. It's it, it it fits, doesn't it? Isaiah two verses two and three says it will come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Adonai's house will stand firm as head of the mountains and will be exalted above the hills. So all nations will flow to it. The many people will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai to the house of the God of Yaakov, and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of Adonai from Yerushalayim. See this? People from nations, people from all nations will say, let us go to the house of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Yaakov. So they will go there to call on the name of Yahweh, which kind of bears a question. Can you only call on the name of Yahweh at the Beit HaMikdash? Um, no. I mean, here's, here's to be an example. Uh, if that were true, you couldn't call on him now. Because there is no standing temple. So not, that's, that's not the point. See, you can call on Yahweh anywhere, anytime, but that does not negate the fact that Yahweh says there was a place he wanted us to gather to do so. Okay? There was a place where he chooses to put his name there. And there is a gathering point of unity when he brings all the people together. And that's what he desires for us, to have a, a people together as one in a place of unity and the one heart, one common goal, and that is the kingdom of Yahweh. All right? We read in Sephania uh, 3.9, I will restore to the people a pure speech so that all of them may call upon the name of Adonai and serve him shoulder to shoulder. Again, notice the connection of a pure speech and calling on the name of Yahweh. When we can all unite together to honor Yahweh, it becomes glorious. When man united before with common goals, remember before at the Tower of Babel, he united with common goals to make a name for himself. And that's not what Yahweh said he to, he, we were to do. We were to make a name for Yahweh. We were to make his name great in the earth. We were to sanctify his name, bring honor to his name as a people set apart. So, Abraham was to declare the goodness of Yahweh and to show the nations the life of covenant in the one true Yahweh. And he did this, he went all through the land of Israel. Romans 10, verses 10 through 15, we read, For with the heart it is believed for righteousness, and with the mouth it is confessed for salvation. The scripture says, Whoever trusts in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, richly generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of Adonai will be saved. Verse 14. So how then shall they call on one whom they have not trusted? And how shall they trust in the one they have not heard of? And how shall they hear without someone proclaiming? And how shall they proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. Wow. See that? So we're talking about how beautiful the feet of them who proclaim good news. Well, what's the deal with his feet? Because he has to go. Because he has to, to go and walk. Remember Genesis 12, what he said to Abraham, go. Because he has to go and live the life of covenant. And you're going to come across people along the way. You're going to share the goodness of Yahweh and talk to him and walk in his ways, right? 
Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces shalom, who brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Now, back to Avram. Genesis 13, 14 to 17. After Lot separated himself from him, Adonai says, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are to the north, south, east, and west. For all the land you are looking at, I will give to you and your seed forever. And I will make your seed like the dust of the earth, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your seed could also be counted. So now do what? Get up, walk about the land through its length and its width, for I will give it to you. Now, again, Yahweh gave this, gave this to Avraham, but Avraham had to get up and walk through the land. You are where you are now in your life because somebody went before you. Somebody paid a price to go before you to pave the way. In everything that you've done, somebody has made a way. Someone went before you, someone has done it, something has happened, and, and Yahweh is calling us to walk in the footsteps of the examples of those great people of faith that we find in the scripture. And ultimately, following Yeshua, he is the one that we need to gather under. And, and Yahweh says that uh, he has sent him to teach us how to walk in his ways. Not to, how to walk contradictory to his ways, but how to walk in his ways. So let's do that. Let's follow our example and let's love one another. Let's love Yahweh our God and let's uh, learn to walk in his ways, to be a light to the nations, to show the covenant of Yahweh and the goodness of our God wherever we may be. Okay. Well, that's all I have for you today, guys. Uh, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. I pray this has challenged you and encouraged you. And if this has been a blessing to you, then please consider sharing it on whatever avenue that you watch or listen, however it is, uh, whatever it may be, please share them and help us get the word out and help do these. And uh, if you, if, if this is a blessing also, please consider making a donation to help us to keep these out on the different platforms that we can put out and go. Um, it, we really do appreciate because it, it does really help guys. Uh, and if you want to help to help spread the word, like we said, right, then a little does go a long way. All right. So with that, uh, I pray that you do be blessed, and in return, I pray that you be a blessing. All right, so until next time, shalom.